My name is Francis Tickey. I'm running for Iowa Secretary of Agriculture. And um, my own background is that I've been a full-time farmer for 27 years. I'm also a scientist by training. I have a PhD in agronomy with a soil fertility specialty. And I've worked at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the past in Washington, D.C., where I served as national program leader for soil science. The reason I'm running for Iowa Secretary of Agriculture is I see we have some major challenges facing us here in, in Iowa today for agriculture. We're not addressing them. We also have some great opportunities on the horizon, and we're not taking advantage of them. And so I'm not really a politician by nature, but um, I see these opportunities, I see these challenges, and so that what's, is what motivated me to run. And I'm going to be talking about them as we go along here. But first I want to talk a little about my own farm. I have a dairy farm. I milk about 80 cows and on about 450 acres, and it's a grass-based dairy farm. It's a bit unique in that what I'm going to talk about in the farm is something that's a model that we can use for agriculture. And that is, I use ecology as a model for my farm. Because um, we know in Iowa we have some of the most productive soils in the world. Uh, and, but if you think back about what happened 12,000 years ago when the glacier receded, there was no soil. It was a geologic wasteland um, of materials brought in from Canada and, and Minnesota and dropped here. It was only during the, the, the intervening time, 12,000 years, when plants and animals began to colonize the landscape that it built the soil. And so we built this deep, rich, dark soil here in Iowa. And one example of that is the prairie grasses. You know, the prairie grasses were famous for growing tall and deep into the ground in the root system. And so what happened then is when the bison would come through and graze off the prairie grasses, that plant was then short, and it didn't need that deep root system. So it sloughed that off into the ground. And then it would grow a new plant and a new root system, and then it'd be grazed off. And so those, those cycles would pulse that organic matter in the soil. And that's what built our very productive soils here in Iowa, very rich soils. However, since we started farming in Iowa, we've lost about half our topsoil to erosion. And we've lost half of that black carbon organic matter to oxidation from crop production. So you might say we've depleted our, our, our ecological capital by our farming methods. But we can farm in ways that will rebuild our soils and that are ecologically and environmentally sound. In my own farm, I try to model that process that built our soils in my dairy and I have the whole uh, 200 acres of the farm planted into grasses and clovers and split up into small paddocks, about two acres each. I have 60 paddocks. And so after each milking twice a day, the cows go to a new pasture and they move around much like the bison did on the prairie. And so now I'm rebuilding my soils. The soils, when I moved to that farm uh, about 15 years ago, some places all the topsoil was gone and deep gullies were there. So we're now rebuilding it with that same process. And this is the process we can use in agriculture more. We need more. Um, cover crops in the landscape, more perennial crops in the landscape. And one thing is, energy is another part of it. Um, most dairy cows are in confinements. You heard of CAFO, that word CAFO, and it's not in the form of espresso, or coffee, or anything. CAFO stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. And, and in dairy farms, most dairy cows are in CAFOs, confi confinement. Then you have to harvest the feed at a distance, bring it to the cows, and you bring it to the area where you milk them, store it, feed the cows daily, and then you have to collect the manure, store it, and then haul it back out to the field. Well, with a well-designed grazing system, all we have to do is open the gate to the next pasture. The cows go to the pasture, they, they harvest their own feed, they spread their own manure right where it needs to be, they enjoy their work, and it's a very healthy environment for them because they're, um, they live longer because they're in their natural environment eating their natural diet. And so, um, and the products are healthier too. Cows on grass have a milk that's higher in omega-3 fatty acids and other uh, healthy attributes. So the point is that, that there are a lot of advantages to using this ecological model. And one uh, other thing is energy. If, if you have to, like I mentioned, if you have to harvest the feed at a distance, then it takes all that energy to, to move the, the, the feed and the manure, whereas the cows, their nature is to do it. Um, a, a friend of mine said, you know, it's the nature of cows to move around and the nature of grass to stand still. But we made the cows stand in one place and made the grass move to the cows. And so only way we could do that is with cheap oil, cheap energy. Um, and that is, if you look at our agriculture pretty much anywhere in Iowa, it, it, you can see that it depends upon cheap energy, especially cheap oil. Without cheap oil, we could not farm the way we do. And we are not going to be able to do that in the future because we are at the end of the cheap oil era. In 2008, when oil prices... Am I on here again? Okay. In 2008, when oil prices went through the roof, it was really difficult for agriculture. Fuel prices and fertilizer prices tripled. And um, there was concern whether farmers were even going to be able to make a crop. Uh, and, and, but now they dropped again. And oil economists tell us we're going to see that roller coaster. Next time, it might hit $200 a barrel. And so um, 
We are highly dependent upon cheap oil, and we need to get beyond cheap energy. And so energy is a big part of what we can do in agriculture. Now, we do produce corn for ethanol for cars going down the highway. The irony is that we're, we're, we're producing energy for cars on the highway, not for agriculture. So we're not securing the energy future for agriculture. So what I would like to see is for us to develop a next generation of biofuels, and that would be using perennial crops that cover the landscape, protect the land, and also it, it could be done at a small scale. Now, there's very promising research that shows that we can do, make biofuels, something called bio-oil, at a local level, at a, even at a farm scale. And, and um, Purdue has just come out with a new portable unit they could take, for example, to farm to farm and produce bio-oil on the farm using perennial crops like prairie grasses and such. To me, that is really an ideal situation because then the profits go in the pocket of the farmer. Now, with, when we have the large ethanol production, um, many of these have been bought by a multinational oil refinery company, so the profits go out of the community, out of state. So, but if we could produce it on the farm, then we would keep the profits locally. Now, when farmers produce corn for ethanol, they still they sell cheap commodity corn, but they pay high rates for their fuel. So they're selling cheap and buying high. And, and uh, JFK said that, President Kennedy, the farmer is the only industry that, that sells everything uh, wholesale, buys everything retail, and pays the freight both ways. So we have to change that. The next generation of biofuels then should produce fuel for agriculture, and it should be at a farm scale and owned by farmers. Then the profits will stay at the farm level. Now, um, we we overbuilt the ethanol industry, the corn ethanol well, industry. So, um, but one thing we need to do is protect our investment. We have a lot of investment in corn ethanol plants around the country, and there's a controversy nationally whether or not the uh, subsidy should be renewed. And and actually, the animal, the livestock industry in Washington D.C. is saying, let's take away the ethanol subsidies because too much corn is going to, uh, to corn is going to ethanol, and nothing, not enough left for livestock. But I think we have to be more conservative than that. We have to maintain our investment in the ethanol in industry we have. But I'm calling for a moratorium on public funding for any new corn ethanol plants. If people want to buy them, they can buy them. But we have to protect the, well, the industry we have now. Farmers depend upon it. But let's not dig the hole any deeper. Instead, let's take what resources we have to the next generation of biofuels that can produce fuel on the farm to power the farm and put the profits in the farmer's pocket. And the same thing with energy systems for wind. We in Iowa now have 20% of our electricity comes from wind. That's a good thing. However, I would like to see the next generation of wind systems be farmer-owned and on the farm scale. On, on farms all across Iowa to see mid-sized wind turbines. So the wind blowing across the farm will power the farm. And now when farmers have wind farms on their land, they, they, they still pay retail rates for electricity. So again, they're selling low and buying high. If they had oil well onto their farm, they wouldn't sell it for pennies on the dollar because we know oil is worth a lot. But wind is even worth more because it's inexhaustible. It'll keep on coming and coming, unlike oil. So that's the next generation of wind then should be uh, distributed across the state, small uh, wind turbines, mid-size on farms all across the state so that the, the farmer um, makes a profit and it stays locally. And there are ways to do that. In Europe, they use what's called feed-in tariffs. It's just a policy option that requires power companies to pay a high rate of return per kilowatt hour for the first part of the lifetime of that turbine. And that allows the farmer to pay for that turbine during those initial years. Then the rate the farmer receives goes down to, re to uh, wholesale levels. And then the power company has cheap green energy for the life of that turbine. Meanwhile, the farmer powers the farm has a, and has a profit center. And again, the profits go in the pocket of the farmer. That's a key thing. Because a lot of our agriculture has, has now evolved to a point where the profits are being extracted out of the farm. Farmers are getting less and less of the profits, all, more and more. And economists tell us that when four corporations control 40% or more of a market, that market starts to act more like a monopoly than like a free market. And we're way past that in agriculture in many markets. For example, in pork processing, four corporations control 66% of the market, way above that 40%. In beef processing, four corporations control 84% of the market. And so farmers are having a hard time finding a free, independent market. I've been speaking to farmers here at a booth, and, and somebody was uh, raising hogs uh, several years ago, he said he just couldn't do it. He can't find a, a, a competitive market anymore because uh, it's too concentrated, too monopolized. In dairy processing, one corporation controls 40% of the market. And you remember uh, uh, about it, well, just this last year, dairy farmers were in the news for having record losses, record low prices at the dairy farm. During that same time, that one corporation, Dean Foods, had two quarters in a row of record profits. So there was a disconnect. And, and uh, economists call this uh, asymmetric pricing. What happens is when the prices fall at the farm level, after milk, then the prices at grocery stores usually stay about the same or fall less. 
and then when the prices go up for farmers, the prices go up in the grocery store. When they fall for farmers, they fall less. And so more and more the spread gets wider and wider, and the farmers get a smaller and smaller slice of the pie. So we have tremendous concentration here in agriculture, and we need to break that up. We need Teddy Roosevelt-style trust busting here in our agricultural markets. Fortunately, the Obama administration is now doing a, ser a series of hearings looking into this matter. So we hope that we get some relief in that matter. But going back to these energy systems, we need to structure our next generation of energy systems so the profit goes to the farmer, not to the corporations. Another uh, point I want to touch on here is uh, with uh, local foods. We can produce a lot more of our food here locally. Um, we in Iowa call ourselves the food capital of the world, but we import 80 to 90 percent of the food we eat in Iowa, believe it or not. We eat about $8 billion worth of food, but we import about 90 percent of it. We could produce a lot more of that right here in Iowa, and again, it would put the money in the, uh, in the pockets of the farmers. Um, one economist from Iowa State has done a little survey, and he, he figured, figured that if we in Iowa ate the recommended five a day of fruits and vegetables, and we produce that here in Iowa for only three months of the year, it would mean $300 million more to our economy and 4,000 new jobs. So we could produce uh, more of that food here in Iowa, and it would be an economic development thing and help rebuild our, our rural economies. In my own case, our dairy farm, uh, we uh, process our milk on the farm. So we make bottled milk and yogurt and cheese on the farm, and we sell it, market it all locally through grocery stores and restaurants. And so on our little farm milking 80 cows, we employ five people besides my wife and myself. So if we can produce, if we can do more of that kind of uh, local value added where the profit goes to the farm level, then we can employ more people and more jobs locally and uh, more bring back our communities, revive our communities. I was talking to an Iowa State University researcher in energy. He said if we would produce all our energy here in Iowa, we would have more jobs than we have people in Iowa. When you think about that, if 60% 60 of our oil is, from, is imported, all of that money is being exported out. If we could take that money we're exporting out of this country, put that into building our infrastructure on, on uh, wind systems and uh, um, biofuel systems that profit the farmers, then, then I think we'd be uh, we'd be rebuilding our, our economy.